So we saw how there was conflict among Protestant Christians over how to deal with the rise of communism. We're going to see something similar, but also different among Catholics. And I'm going to talk about uh, an incident that was written by uh, about in a book called Church Militant uh, by a friend of mine. And uh, but before we talk about the Chinese case, we I just need to review something about Catholic ecclesiology, which is just a fascinating way of saying how Catholics understand the church to work. So for people like Y.T. Wu and uh, Wang Ming Dao, you can leave and establish new churches, right? For, for typically for, and I'm oversimplifying, I apologize, but, but Protestant Christians generally understand the church as an invisible institution. God knows who the true members of the church are. So you can kind of, it's, it's, it, I don't want to say it's not painful at often. If you have a, a church division, it is painful. Um, but the key thing is for Protestants, it's not such a strong part of their identity. What church they are a member of. So I remember, um, this isn't my best example, but I remember talking to a, a pretty devout uh, Baptist who traveled to a place where there were no Baptist churches, and she just found a Protestant church that she felt was close enough to, Protestant, to Baptist Christianity that she could, she could go there in good conscience, which is not how a Catholic would, would typically do things. If you're a Catholic, you go to Catholic church. That's what you do. You can visit another church, but it doesn't count. And just the whole idea of saying it doesn't count. If you're Protestant, you're like, well, what do you mean? It's like, well, no, if you're Catholic, you're supposed to attend church every week and um, yeah. And if you don't attend the Catholic, you can't say, well, I'm going to go visit a Protestant church. That's going to count. It doesn't work that way. So there's, that makes it harder to kind of divide in that sense, right? That's what makes Catholicism kind of curious because you, you, if you, 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 it's hard to lead the Catholic church if you want to keep the Catholic name, right? You can be a Presbyterian and leave your Presbyterian church and form a new one. People will still probably accept you as Presbyterian. A little bit hard to do that with Catholicism because of how the ecclesiology works. And of course that idea of, and this is because Catholics believe in a visible church that has a kind of teaching authority and there's no Chinese Pope. The teaching authority is generally foreign. So Catholicism in many respects posed a greater danger from the communist perspective because it's harder to split it. Um, it's, it's really, it's, it's harder logically to establish a separate Catholic church. So the government is going to come down harder on Catholics uh, in many respects than Protestants because it is connected to the foreign and that's intrinsic to what it is. And in many ways, the, the center of the, um, at least of urban Catholic life is Shanghai, which is the kind of uh, cultural and economic capital of the country during this time period. As I said before, from the Chinese Catholic or Chinese communist perspective, Catholicism is, is seen as dangerous uh, in large part because of its foreign connections. And that's, uh, and that's related to imperialism. Right. We talked about how, remember those two German missionaries who were killed, uh, that was used by the German government to justify expanding in uh, China. And those two missionaries were Catholics, right? This, this was often connected. Um, Catholicism was also very anti-communist officially. So that creates a problem. I mean, the Catholic Church is, was and is very, very uh, anti-communism. In addition, uh, as we talked about before, co communism is officially an atheist government. Uh, Catholicism is, is theistic, believing in God. So there's this view that Catholicism is kind of a backwards religion. It's holding people back. Atheism is progressive. We don't want this reactionary the theism there. But there's kind of a problem because the government had promised in its common program what would become the Constitution. It had promised freedom of religion. And Catholicism is an official religion. So there's this kind of question of then how do you deal with Catholics? And this anti, this communist anti-Catholic uh, cartoon gives us a clue about how that works. Because here you've got uh, the ideas hidden underneath the Catholic religion, the Catholic faith. You've got a spy using a radio to transmit secrets to China's imperialist anti-communist enemies. Right? And this is, I mean, this is generally made up. Um, I think there's maybe a couple of things where maybe foreign missionaries were doing this, but I don't believe Chinese uh, Catholics were really engaged in this kind of work. Um, but th this is how they're going to present Catholics. So the way you deal with this is instead of claiming that the Catholics are being targeted because of their religion, you claim it's because, well, no, they're, they're pro-imperialist, they're um, anti-communist. Um, that's how you go after them. And you can see a similar image there where you've got a Catholic a bishop uh, s spreading news, giving information to 
the United States, right? And I mean, man, does this guy look evil. And wow, the U.S., even though it's just our hand, we look evil too. And so Catholics are going to be in Shanghai are going to be accused of political crimes. There's an argument that they are guilty of maintaining connections with Westerners. And this amounts to espionage and spying. And of course they're connecting. Uh, they have Western connections. It's the Catholic Church. The Pope is in Italy, right? So it's really, it's tricky because these are religious things, but the government is able to present them uh, politically. And so, and this is also what's important. Um, and this is one problem about that makes it difficult to live in a totalitarian government where the government officially controls everything because the, um, imagine you're a Catholic in China and you, or let's say you're a Catholic in the United States, you pick up the newspaper, you go to a website and there's something that you think is unfair about Catholicism in that website or on that newspaper. You can write a letter. You can have an editor, letter to the editor. You can boycott. There's a lot of different things you can do. But in China, journalism serves the party. So when newspapers attack Catholicism in uh, for these things, and you're a Catholic and you say, I disagree with this, too bad. If you write a letter to the editor, they're not going to print it and the police may show up and say, why are you supporting foreign imperialism? So this is a problem. They will also take over Catholic schools. It's an authoritarian, totalitarian government. They say, we control all education. We need to make sure people are having a progressive education. None of this reactionary stuff, none of this teaching about God, that's holding our country back. And so we're going to take over Catholic schools, force people to study communism. If you criticize this, you are acting politically. You don't get to do that. Only the government gets to act politically unless we mobilize the people, in which case you can, but we're not going to mobilize people to support communism or support Catholicism. And you're not allowed to be neutral in this, right? You, you can't even just withdraw from it. So for example, if you're Catholic, you might be forced to participate in a parade like this that is criticizing a Catholic organization called the Legion of Mary. And here you have an example of this kind of propaganda I was talking about where you have um, these uh, Chinese people, it says rescuing legionnaires, these people are legion, members of the Legion of Mary from the pit and uniting them under the leadership of the party. Right? And you're not allowed to respond to this. You're not allowed to defend the, the Legion of Mary and so on and so forth. And so again, like I pointed out, there's this kind of tricky thing about Catholic identity that um, it's really hard to separate from the Catholic Church and still be considered Catholic. But the government is still going to try. It forms what's called the three self-patriotic Catholic Church as opposed to the three self-patriotic Protestant Church. And if you're a uh, priest or just a common lay people, uh, and you move over to this, you will be rewarded, right? You may be given a better job, you may be given some money, or at the very least, you don't have to worry about being arrested. But if you're a Catholic leader who opposes, there's a good chance, you're, whether you're foreign or Chinese, you're going to be arrested. Um, if you're a loyal supporter of the Catholic Church and not even a leader, you might be jailed or face social sanctions, right? You may face um, a lot of uh, peer pressure, people will criticize you, and you might go to jail. And so this is going to help split the Catholic Church, where some Catholics will say, I can't handle this. Um, I'm afraid for my job. Uh, I'm afraid to go to jail. Uh, and you may have good reasons to be afraid to go to jail. You may have a family to support. So I'm going to support the three self-patriotic Catholic Church. Um, I might do this wholeheartedly and say, this is great. We need to get Rome off our back. We need to have more power uh, for Chinese Catholics. Or you may just go along with the minimum in hopes that that's enough to... Um, keep you safe and just pray that God forgives you. Um, but if you resist this, you can get in a lot of trouble. So you're given this kind of difficult choice. Either I resist and I face uh, social sanctions, I face possible jail, or I um, go along with it. This might violate my conscience. Um, I might be very uncomfortable with this because it goes against my, my ideology or my understanding of Catholicism. And just to this man here on the right, this is Cardinal Kung Pin Mei. He was the bishop of Shanghai, and he's going to be arrested similar to Wang Ming Dao in the 1950s, and he won't get out until 1980. So he'll spend like 25 years uh, in prison. So very, very difficult stuff. To help emphasize this, some people um, are forced to confess crimes. This is something that was often done in communist uh, societies in Soviet Union um, China, People's Republic of China, where you would be forced to sign a false confession. And when that came from leaders, that m hurt morale and leads to defection. So you might be someone who wants to support the, um, the um, Catholic Church, um, 
but then you hear the but you're afraid and then you hear that a leader uh, a priest that you respected has gone over to the three self patriotic catholic church and you're like i guess it's okay i guess it's fine and so the government does this really good job of splitting the catholic church and then you get this kind of official church which goes along with the government and an underground church and this has gone on for decades, and it's a lot more painful for Catholics because of their their particular uh, ecclesiology. And it's not clear how or if it will ever uh, be fixed because there's a lot of anger between these groups because the the underground church sees himself as the true church, um, which was suffering, whereas the three self patriotic Catholic church will, will often just say, "Look, practically, this is what we had to do in order to survive." So this will be an issue. It's an issue right now. It will probably be an issue in the future. Now I do need to talk about some some um, some of the, the the things that are going on in the Chinese Communist government outside of Christianity, so we can better understand what's going. Some other things I need to talk about later, so I don't want to go too much into this. But um, there was a concern among the Chinese communists that they they needed to industrialize quickly. They needed to make their country a powerful country, uh, economically strong country, in order to protect it and to protect communism. And this led to the launching of this thing called The Great Leap Forward. And there's this really interesting idea here. Um, and this is a song with The Great Leap Forward. And by Great Leap Forward, they mean rapid economic growth, right? Rapid economic growth. And there's an interesting song. In heaven, there is no jade emperor. On earth, there is no dragon king. I am the jade emperor. I am the dragon king. I order the three mountains and five peaks. Make way. Here I come. And what this is saying is, this is this materialist worldview. There is no heaven. Or I'm sorry, there, there is no, the, the gods don't exist. The spirits don't exist. However, and this is what's what's curious because this is not kind of a typical communism. However, I can do amazing things if I believe in communism enough. So it's not so much there are no gods as I can become like a god if I just believe in communism enough. It's, it's, it's a long story. I talk about more in my modern China class, but that's the idea. This is a kind of magical thinking. Um, I can become like a God. And if we all believe enough in communist doctrine, if we all give our hearts completely to it and work really hard, we can do miraculous things and develop our country economically very quickly. And to give you an example of what this means in practice, um, these are peasant farmers and they are being asked to make iron and they um, are making, uh, or I'm sorry, make steel and they're making steel using these backyard furnaces. And so instead of farming, they are spending time making furnace, uh, trying to make uh, steel. Well, I won't go too much in detail here, but if you take, if you don't let farmers farm and you have them do other work, they aren't growing food. And that's a problem because China didn't have enough much food to begin with. And if farmers are doing stuff other than growing food, you're going to have even less food. Um, this and other bad policies led to a famine. And just to give you an idea of how bad the famine was, these are the, the various famines from 1860 to 2010. These are the deaths. And you'll notice they're pretty low or they're, there's a lot of them that are down here in just a few million. Got one in China and India here that are pretty severe. Soviet Union famine. And then, boom, here's China up here at about 24 million people dying in the famine. Um, this kind of magical thinking doesn't really work. Um, this idea that just, you know, if you believe hard enough, we can we can make economy worse. Because what happened was, you know, you take you have people who aren't farm farming because they're making steel. Guess what? Uh, you don't grow as much food. And on top of that, they made steel that wasn't really good because um, backyard furnaces don't get hot enough to make good steel. And I, I have to share this other example that's really sad was they decided that one reason that the um, they weren't getting enough food um, was because they um, they had too many sparrows. And it's this kind of sparrow, this cute little guy here. And so they went out and shot sparrows. And there you can see this; these are villagers shooting a sparrow. And uh, there's just, I can't, it, there's just something, a part of me that has a hard time believing that this was a serious poster. Um because you've just got these people, all these guns killing this one little tiny sparrow. And I don't, I have birds. If you've ever held a bird, they just feel like the most fragile things ever. Cause they have like hollow bones and they're mostly feathers. Uh, they have hollow bones. They have to be light in order to fly. Right. So th this just always makes me really sad to see this image. The, the big problem with this was that scientists would point out that these birds, it does true eat crops. They also eat bugs that eat crops and they actually, um, they eat more bugs that eat crops than they eat crops. Meaning that, if you kill them, you actually have a net loss of food. 
any good biologist could have told people that didn't matter because they had this magical thinking that if I believe enough in communism, if I have fervor, I can do it. This failed. And this was the policy of, um, I'm going to go way, way back, of this guy Mao Zedong. Uh, he was the guy that was basically in charge during this time. And he said, this is going to work. This is how we beat the nationalists by believing strongly enough. This is going to work. This is what we're going to do. And um, it didn't work, right? It didn't work. And so what Mao Zedong did, instead of saying, well, I guess my ideas didn't work. I need to rethink how I'm doing things. Uh, he said, you know what? The actual problem is not my ideas. It's that we didn't believe enough. We were held back by traditional culture. And so he launched this thing in 1966 called the Cultural Revolution. And here you can see, um, this is kind of a, well, yeah, you can see this guy holding a hammer and it says, destroy the old world, build the new world, right? We have to act in this de de for destruction. And you'll see all the different things being destroyed, but you'll notice there is a Buddha and there's a crucifix, right? So Christianity, uh, we didn't fail to have rapid economic development instead get a famine because I was wrong. We failed because we didn't destroy the old culture. It's, it's Christianity and Buddhism's fault um, that our backyard furnaces didn't work. Um, and that murdering sparrows did not lead to an increase in food. Um, but that's the idea. And he turns to young people to, to do this. And what happens also, you can kind of see here, he becomes almost like a godlike figure. Like here's, he had this thing called the little red book, which is being treated as a kind of sacred scripture. It was the kind of doctrinal guide for society. And there you can see him presented as the sun, uh, shining on everyone. I think this is something like long live, uh, chairman Mao's thought. Uh, this is his name. This is thought. So it's hurrah for, for Chairman Mao's thought. Um, and so this is very dangerous, right? If you're a Christian trying to live during this time period, uh, this is a very dangerous time to be trying to believe in Christianity or any religion because remember, it's not just Christianity. It's doubt, uh, Buddhism as well that's being attacked. So um, during this time period, many religious leaders were jailed or killed, even among officially recognized religions. So the fact that you were a Buddhist, a Protestant, a Catholic, a Muslim, a Taoist, it didn't matter. Uh, you were holding the country back. Um, you only get your rights when you're not an enemy of the people. You're an enemy of the people because you're religious, but you're holding this back. This is really bad. And so religion will disappear from public view. Churches will be shuttered. Uh, this is Matteo Ricci. Remember him? He, there was an old church dedicated to him. Um, and it's taken over by the government and it becomes a government building. So religion will disappear from public view. Now, what's interesting though, is that even though it disappears and some people thought religion had been completely destroyed, there were people who thought that this was problematic, that this was crazy. So if some opponents to the government policy would say, well, we can't destroy this because though they're religious artifacts, they're part of our culture. And so we should preserve it. And it, I understand that you think it's a bad thing. We need to preserve it to criticize it. Right? It's very clever. It's like, no, we can't destroy this religious statue. We need to leave it up because it shows how great our culture was that we could produce this. And we need to take people here on a tour and tell them, you know, here's this thing. Isn't it beautiful? But it was built with the blood of the workers. And then you just kind of go on. But you got to preserve the thing, right? Uh, and that was a strategy. Uh, and they would quote Mao. They would quote the little red book there that says um, we use the past to serve the present. And so oftentimes what happened was religion would go underground literally, like Matteo Ricci's tomb was buried and other tombs of missionaries. Um, and one thing I think was hilarious was the Catholic priest in one area was named head of the anti-religious combat office. Guess how much time he spent combating religion? I'm guessing not very much, right? So there were ways to try and subvert this. Uh, and like I said, one way to do this was to hide the tombs and things like that. So this is one way that you could try and survive during the cultural revolution. But the idea is here, you have this idea, uh, all religion, including especially Christianity, is kind of dangerous. It's holding us back. We need to get rid of it. And you can't protest openly. You can try and do so underground. And I do want to go back momentarily and talk about this guy, Y.T. U. Remember, he was the guy that tried to, who thought you could work with the communists. You could establish this kind of three self patriotic movement. And everything would be great. Guess what? During the Cultural Revolution, he was arrested and thrown in jail. So I think um, the people who opposed it, like Wing Meng Dao and uh, Cardinal Kung, they were thrown in jail in the 1950s. He managed to, to have another 10 years or so of freedom, and he was thrown in jail in the 1960s. And I'm not trying to be critical of the guy. Uh, I just think it's tragic and sad that you did have this guy, uh, this, that he was a, a serious Christian who thought that you could work with the communists. And this is always a danger whenever you work with an authoritarian, totalitarian government. 
uh, may not turn out well, unfortunately. And he is thrown in jail. I think he is released in 1980 and then will die shortly after that. 